Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kathleen Rest, Executive Director of the Union of Concerned Scientists. The Union of Concerned Scientists puts rigorous, independent science to work to solve the planet's most pressing problems. It began as a collaboration between students and faculty members at MIT in 1969 and is now an alliance of more than 400,000 citizens and scientists. Kathy has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. So when I was a child, it seemed that science was the one place where it was safe to examine problems from a neutral perspective, develop evidence, and then create approaches to, to addressing whatever the, the issue was. But now it seems that the way science is treated um, is, is a matter of, of debate as to even whether you can discuss things like global warming or like the impact uh, of uh, particular uh, policies or whether uh, evolution is even something that can be discussed. Talk about the Union of Concerned Scientists and how the Union of Concerned Scientists functions in today's environment. Well, you're right in your observation. It does seem like science has become increasingly politicized and that people are using it to push their own agendas or their own ideologies when in fact, you know, science actually has been with us since the Founding Fathers. Our Founding Fathers knew the value of science to making good decisions. Without strong and solid science, it's really hard to know how you come up with really well-informed decisions, really good policies. At the Union of Concerned Scientists, science is really our calling card. We use it to drive the issues that we work on. We use it to inform the decisions that we make and we use it to drive the recommendations that we make for policy. I mean, unfortunately, I think right now in this sort of excessively partisan environment that we're living in, coupled with a 24-hour news cycle that can be an echo chamber with people arguing about basic scientific facts that have been settled makes it challenging. But at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we believe that science really is fundamental to making good decisions. And that's what we try to do, and that's what we try to advocate for. So let's break down what science actually is. So science is based on observation and uh, replication and transparency, uh, making sure that methods that are being used are fully accessible and available to others to go in and sort of replicate and see if they can replicate what you've found or what you're doing. So I think, you know, good science is really based on observation of what's happening in the world. Measurement, observation, testing, uh, good peer review putting forward your findings and, and making them accessible to others to critique. We learn from science. I mean, science progresses, right? We build on science. We learn from science. Peer review helps us see uh, problems or flaws in methodology that you can correct for and go on for, and we build and learn. Is, is science a, a, a place where opinion can get tested against reality? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, science is not opinion, right? I mean... Uh, so science is not opinion, but, but no, people so come to the table with opinions. I mean, you have opinions. Certainly. I'm sure that, that in, in your own work, your own research, and, and that of the 400,000 people, everybody comes with some, some opinion, but that's, the opinion isn't the science. No, the opinion is not the science. And, you know, one of the challenges that we have as scientists is to help people understand and differentiate fact from fiction or fact from spin or ideology, uh, that's a challenge. And we may certainly come to different conclusions about what to do with the science. If science uh, drives policy, we may have different opinions of how it should drive the policy and we may disagree um, 
respectfully on what is the best way to approach the policy. Or disrespectfully, but it doesn't make it, but even those disagreements don't, it, it doesn't make the, the science untestable. No, no. And, you know, we sh the, the science helps us establish the facts upon which to then base the decisions or the, the, the problems that we're trying to solve, taking a quick look at them and trying to decide how to move forward. We, we, we need to have agreements on the basic facts. And then we can agree or disagree on what to do about them. So let's say I am a, a, a politician and I worry about my constituents and jobs and I'm, I'm worried about um, the, the beliefs of, of the voters who are going to uh, vote me in or, or out of, of, of my position. Um, how does that differ from how the Union of Concerned Scientists takes its policy dis, uh, uh, positions? Because I'm caring about voters. You don't have voters. No. So talk about your policy uh, positions and, and how you arrive at those policy positions. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the Union of Concerned Scientists. The things that are most important to us are uh, rigorous and independent science and technical analysis. And independent meaning? Independent meaning that it's not sponsored or bought or com uh, coming to the fore with a pre-existing conclusion. So funded by somebody who has a, uh, an a interest in a particular or, result? Yes. Okay. Right. So for example, if I was testing the safety of automobiles, General Motors or BMW or Peugeot or Volkswagen funding that science, that's, I have an interest in what those results are. My right. car should look safer than everybody else. And what's most important is that your funding of that study, Mr. General Motors, is that that should be transparent. Right. People should know. People should know. That you funded the study. It doesn't necessarily mean that the study is flawed or, flawed, or bad. It just but that everybody should know. Everyone should know. So there's a transparency. So exactly. independence requires a certain rigor. Yes. And it requires transparency. Um, and it requires an objective perspective on both the, the structure of the examination and the results. Yes. We, we're solutions oriented. We're right. looking for practical solutions. We don't do science just to write papers, put them in a journal, put them on the shelf. We're actually doing science and technical analysis to help solve practically some of the complex and very daunting problems that we face. So what are those problems that you've identified? So what I can tell you right now, uh, one of our primary priorities is the issue of global warming. I mean, we're focused on looking at both the causes of global warming, the impacts of global warming, and solutions that we know are already out there that we could begin to implement to deal with the global warming problem. Another thing that we really try to do is to communicate our findings in a com compelling way. We, we want to make our reports, our research, our analyses, and our recommendations uh, compelling and accessible to okay. policy makers, to opinion leaders, to the citizens that we work with and on behalf of. So, so often, let's take the, the issue of global warming. We have uh, a number of clients who are from the fossil fuels industry, sure. serving on various boards and so on. In many respects, this whole global warming top, uh, topic is viewed by people who um, are from that sector of the economy as being against fossil fuels. Is that really what's going on here, or, or is it something else? Because that's a conclusion. That's a conclusion. It's, it's right. that fossil well, fuels are causing global warming. That's right, and the science backs that up. Okay. Right? I mean, there's international recognition from scientific societies all across the world that fossil fuels are contributing and a major driver of global warming. So isn't, your, isn't that conclusion a threat to the fossil fuel industry? They could object to the conclusion or they could be part of the solution. I mean, we do have innovators out there. I mean, over time, things have changed, right? right. We have, take for example, the 
transportation sector in this country. I mean, one of the uh, major emitters of carbon pollution uh, relates to the gasoline that we put into the cars that we drive. Or in the electricity sector, the oil and the gas that we use to heat our homes and otherwise power our lives. In the auto industry, I mean, what we've seen is despite years of saying it's not possible, we've seen the auto industry in this country really innovate and fuel economy has increased dramatically in this country. So we're actually doing more with less we through are. innovation that comes from science raising issues than also developing solutions to those issues. That's right. So those scientists, uh, uh, other scientists are developing so once the issue is raised by these scientists, these scientists here are developing solutions that will, that will pull out more energy from the same mass of, uh, of fuel. Yes. So, you know, we rely on entrepreneurs and innovators and others to help us push forward. Despite the gridlock that we see in Washington from some of our congressional leaders, we have local leaders and communities all across the country that are experiencing the impacts of global warming, the consequences of global warming right now on the ground. And they are connecting the dots of what's happening uh, to these extreme weather events. Well, the storms in Texas right now are, are, are pretty good examples. And, and what is going on on the coastal regions are very good examples. Of, of once in a century, once in a thousand year events, which seems to be, it seem to be happening almost on a, on a regular basis. I mean, we have sea level rise, we have storm surge, what we saw both of those with Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast. We have excessive heat waves that we're experiencing and have experienced just this past year in the Midwest and in California. We see wildfires, the season getting longer, the intensity of those fires increasing. There's drought. So all of these consequences that are related or exacerbated in some way by global warming and the carbon pollution that we're putting into the air, our communities are seeing them and are dealing with them on the ground. They're not waiting for Washington. And one of the things that we're doing at the Union of Concerned Scientists this year is trying to shine a spotlight on some of those local consequences so that we can build the, the political backing that our leaders in Washington will need to take action on this on a national scale. And in terms of the Union of Concerned Scientists, how do you interact with your citizens, your scientists? How, how does that, how do people uh, become involved with your organization? Um, and how do you, uh, you structure the Union of Concerned Scientists to, to support this community? Because in many respects, it's like a social media community. It's, it's, we do a lot of work for Wikipedia, and there you have a, a really huge international community. In many respects, you function, or you seem to function, with your citizens and your scientists in, a, in quite a similar way. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, the Union of Concerned Scientists has been around a very long time. As you mentioned when you introduced this segment, we have about 450,000 uh, activists, members, and supporters who work with us. That means uh, th they leverage the work that we do. Mm -hmm. They engage in the work that we do uh, by uh, participating in the policy process, sending uh, writing op-eds, meeting with their uh, leaders, uh, talking about the issues, educating each other. Contributing their research. Contributing, contributing their, their research. Work. We also have 20,000 members of what we call our science network mm -hmm. uh, at the Union of Concerned Scientists. 20,000 scientists, scientists, engineers, economists, public health, public health professionals from all across the country that are members of our science network that are also there to lend their voice to what the science tells us, especially to talk about what's happening with the science that they're 
that they're working on the science that's affecting some of the things that are happening in their regions or in their communities and basically bringing their voices uh, into the policy process. And um, how, how is your organization um, structured? Do you have a, a huge staff of thousands or, or is it quite modest? Well, we, we do fight above our weight. But, and, and we have a nice solid staff. We have about 140 people uh, that work for us. We are in different locations. Our headquarters is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right in the heart of Harvard Square. We have an office in Washington, D.C., a smaller office in Berkeley, California, and an office also in uh, Chicago. And you have, um, your, your areas include the normal uh, infrastructure areas of finance sure. and, and those kinds of things. So finance, administration, communications, uh, as I said, uh, creating compelling communications is, a, is a, a huge part of what we do. It's a big issue. It's a very big issue because we need to be able to communicate to our members in ways that connect to things that they care about things that are affecting their daily lives, things that they value, and also be able to translate complex science uh, into something that is accessible, understandable, and actionable. What about your non-members? Because it's, it's all well and good to talk with the converted, those people who are already part of your ecosystem, but so often in, in the U.S. today, we, we seem to be talking to ourselves as opposed to reaching across different belief systems and, and uh, people with different values. H how do you uh, uh, engage others? Well, a fair amount of the work that we do, we do in coalition or in partnership with other people, which brings us out. Uh, we also work beyond the beltway. Uh, and we try very hard to engage a variety of people that are interested in these issues in the work that we're doing. Take climate change, for example. Given our focus on local impacts and local consequences, this brings us into communication with folks that we haven't worked with in the past. So, for example, um, local emergency planners, uh, insurers, um, zoning people in the communities. So urban planning. Yeah. Urban planning. Um, it, it really gives us entree to engage a whole variety of people that we haven't reached out to and touched in the past who are not members of the Union of Concerned Scientists and maybe will never be members of the Union of Concerned Scientists but actually are grappling with the problems and will be part of the solution that's out there. We also um, strongly believe in reaching out to young scientists, uh, to the faith community, uh, to the media. Um, so we do try to get our voice out there. We try not to just sit and talk to ourselves. Not to mention the fact that you have ambassadors in, in, uh, in all the major universities. We do. Um, who are sitting on faculty, who are accepting um, uh, who are conducting research, accepting research grants uh, from, from diverse sources. Right, many of whom are members of the Union of Concerned Scientists. What is the next step for the organization as you develop your, your future? Where, how are you uh, expecting to evolve? Is it more, uh, to place more emphasis in getting the message out? Is it, is it in expanding your footprint? Are you going to evolve your programs? Well, we've evolved our program over time. You know, as you mentioned back in 1968, when, 1969 when we were founded, the issue back then was really um, sort of the, the militarization of science, right, with people being concerned that a lot of the scientific research funding was being put into developing things for destructive purposes when in fact we should be reallocating that money to solve social problems. So back then in 69, you know, the focus was on um, arms control, we, we branched out and went into nuclear power. Over, right. over, the, over years, we picked up the issue of climate change, clean transportation, sustainable agriculture. So over time, our portfolio has grown. Uh, and of course, we will 
continue to grow, I'm sure, as things change. I mean, what I can tell you about the Union of Concerned Scientists is that we are persistent because many of the issues that we work on, the ones that we just talked about, have been around for a long time and they will be around for a long time and we will continue to work on them. We don't give up in the face of uh, challenge, so we will continue to work on issues. We're also nimble. If things aren't working in Washington, that's okay. If the evidence shows that it isn't working, you change your tact? If the evidence shows that it isn't working, we need to develop a new strategy and a new tact. And persistence is a virtue when one sees just the few people who are recognized um, in, 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 with the Nobel Prizes, for example, but, but who are recognized regardless and how persistent they need to be. And, and how they are just the few who are recognized of all the other persistent individuals who are intrepidly following that path to truth. Uh, it, it would be a, a pretty daunting task to think that a scientist is going to uh, give up on that pursuit. Uh, so Kathleen Rest, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and thank you for your insights. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you.